Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thanks again for tuning in to the third installment of Quasi's 2018 Fall Cyber Seminar Series. Uh, just some brief housekeeping issues before we, be we begin. The talk will be approximately 45 minutes, and there'll be time for questions at the end, which I'll moderate. I'm Catherine Schleff. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at Quasi, and I'm the one organizing the seminar series. Um, so in the meantime, you'll notice that you're muted to re reduce the feedback noise. If you have any issues during the talk, um, please feel free to message me or put your hand up and I'll, and I'll message you to do my best to resolve them for you. So now to our speaker and the exciting talk that we have planned today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ethan Yang, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Lehigh University. Ethan earned a bachelor's in geography and a master's in, bio, in bio, environmental systems engineering from the National Taiwan University. And then he went on to get a doctorate in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I got to know him while he was a research scientist and research assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I was always impressed by how long he worked, number one. He'd always be in the office before I came in after I left. But he always managed to be productive and work on exciting and complex projects, which I think we're going to see some of today regarding the water energy food nexus. Uh, projects that require complex models and lots of coding in programs like GAMS, from my memory. Anyways, despite all this and his ability to do amazing work, he always had time to answer questions and listen to my ideas, and I really appreciated that. So I'm very excited that he agreed to give a talk. And um, Ethan, please go ahead. Great. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, I'm actually really grateful to have this um, opportunity uh, to be here at a quasi uh, cyber seminar series. Um, and thanks a lot for the uh, nice introduction from, from Catherine. Um, as Catherine mentioned that um, the talk of mine today is uh, evaluating the full energy water nexus issue in a coupled natural human systems. I'm going to use the agent-based modeling approach. So this, let me see, I move this ahead. Yes. Okay. So this is the outline of my talk today. I will give you uh, a, a introduction about our um, uh, research, and now I'll talk about uh, what do I mean by water, food, energy, and also environmental nexus. I will give you a brief uh, um, uh, uh, introduction about the methodology that we use. It's called agent-based modeling. And I will use three of our previous projects to show you how we use this agent-based modeling approach, ABN approach, to um, evaluate these uh, water, food, energy, and environmental nexus issue. I'm going to wrap up the talk by uh, some of my ongoing projects and to share with you. So um, we actually call ourselves COWS. Uh, complex adaptive water systems re uh, research groups. So the overarching um, science question that we uh, try to answer is, how do the complex interaction between humans and nature affect Earth systems at different temporal and, and spatial scale? So obviously, this is a big picture question. Then the big picture answer from our perspective is we should use a systems approach with natural thinking. Then you will probably ask, then what is the system approach? And what do you mean by nexus thinking? Okay, so let me uh, use this general question to answer that. So the question I pick is actually how to get married. Believe it or not, it's actually a complex enough question that you can use this approach to answer that. So um, how to get married? Uh, if we want to use the, this approach, uh, the first step is let's break it down into several different uh, sub quad part or sub questions. Okay, so how to get married? Obviously, you need to find a partner because you you, you probably cannot get married alone. Uh, you need to pick a ring, you need to pick a location, de uh, decide who to invite, right? And that's what I mean by systems approach. For a big picture, uh, overarching big questions, we should break it down into different um, sub part or sub questions. And that can help us better understand these overarching questions. Now, inside each of these sub questions or the, uh, the different parts, there are different aspects that's going to link with each other. Um, for example, uh, how to find a partner for, for, for myself. Um, uh, I do like a woman. 
Uh, I want uh, she can speak the same language, has the same interest, right? But most importantly, what we should do is pay more attention on the part that's connected to different uh, different sub question or different part. And that's what I mean by nexus thinking. So for example, I do have a girlfriend and I know she doesn't like Tiffany. So when I pick a rent, I should try to avoid Tiffany because what's the point to buy the rent that she doesn't like, right? And that's the connection between two different parts is what I mean by nexus thinking. So going back to the real uh, research question, among all the couple human nature system uh, 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 questions, this one, water, food, environment, and uh, uh, energy nexus is the most interesting one to me. And from this, from now in this talk, I'm gonna call it Wi-Fi nexus. Then the question is why, right? Among all other questions, why I'm particularly interested in these questions in the in in the Wi-Fi nexus issue, because to me that's actually a humanity issue. Currently, there are 1.1 billion people who have, who have no access to clean water. 1.3 billion live without electricity, and 1.02 billion are hungry. In the future, because the population is growing and because there are some uh, uncertain climate change impact, we will need more water, more food, and more energy. And that's gonna cause a higher stress on our environment. Traditionally, we try to solve these um, uh, security issues separately, but I think most of us know they are not. Right? We need water to support our uh, ecosystems. We use water to irrigate our crop. We grow biofuel crop for energy purpose, and we use energy to treat, to heat, to move our water. And obviously, there will be a reverse order in these dynamics. So without nexus thinking, solving the security issue in one sector could most likely cause a security issue in, in, in another one. Let me give you an example. So as I say, <clears throat> we grow biofuel crop for uh, the energy purpose, right? But growing biofuel crop might require more water, or you will just use up the lands that we were, uh, you, uh, it was originally used for the food crop. And that's the reason right now we have this so-called second generation biofuel crop that try to use some agricultural residual to generate uh, biofuel. Okay. Another example is groundwater pumping. So during the drought conditions, we pump groundwater to compensate the loss of surface water. The pumping groundwater requires additional energy, and the dropping water table could cause some environmental concern. So this is the reason why I say we will need a, a system to approach it with nexus thinking to solve this kind of issue. Then, as a scientist, the science question that can help us to better understand this Wi-Fi nexus are still the most interesting one to me. So in this talk, as I mentioned in my outline, I'm gonna use three um, projects to, to e explain how we actually evaluate this, right? And then that, that's actually associated with three different science questions. The first question is, what is the first step that we can uh, so we, uh, that we can use to quantify the human ecosystem interaction in, in this Wi-Fi nexus context. The second question: How can we accommodate the natural variability in this nexus? The third question is: How can we address human behavior uncertainty in the Wi-Fi nexus? Okay. So for for the first question, I'm going to use a case study in the Euro River to show you how we quantify human ecosystem interaction. Second question, I'm gonna use case study in the main cons to show you how we couple a human model with a process-based hydrological model. The third question, I'm gonna uh, use a case study in the same one, river basin, to show you how we develop a new human model that try to address um, human behavior uncertainty. Okay. So I use the term human model so you might ask, what do you mean by a human model? To me, that's actually not a traditional social economic model, but a more realistic, more complex modeling approach. And based on my title, I assume you can all guess the name of that model, it's called agent-based modeling. And if you're laughing, although I cannot see you right now, but if you're laughing uh, because of this figure, you're probably at my age, because this is actually a movie from, I think it's almost 20 years ago, it's called Matrix. 
And these are the agents in that movies. They are, their name's Agent Smith, by the way. So whenever I, I mention that I use agent-based modeling approach to evaluate this Wi-Fi nexus issue, there are two common questions that I, I will usually got. The first one is, what is ABN? Okay. A, uh, agent -based model, a, ABN is actually coming from computer science, distributed artificial intelligence. In all of our previous projects, we define an agent as an object that is driven by its own utility function. This is important. It is driven by its own utility function, not a system-wide utility function. An agent will follow some behavior rules, and an agent will interact with other agents and also the environment autonomously. So to me, if you want to claim your model is an agent-based model, these are the three minimum criteria that your model has to uh, satisfy. Okay. Then the second common question that I will, I will commonly got is why, right? Why you choose ABN to, uh, to, to, to uh, evaluate this issue? Because my, uh, my reasoning is because using uh, ABN, we can actually partially release some constraints that, that, that we cannot uh, solve uh, for, from the traditional uh, social economic models. So we call those models like a top-down control model that regarding human decisions, and when we use that for the uh, Wi-Fi Nexus study, usually those models will suffer from uh, different limitations, such as the results will be difficult for us to do the policy implementations, and usually those models assume complete information exchange, which is all uh, actually not true, especially in the transboundary river basin management. And also they will suffer from what we call curse of dimensionality. That means they will take a lot of time to solve. So by using ABN, I can at least partially release these um, constraints, okay? So as I mentioned, I'm gonna use three of my uh, previous projects uh, to show you that different aspect inside this within Nexus. The first project I'm gonna talk about is how we quantify human ecosystem, uh, human ecosystem interactions. Uh, we're gonna use, use Yellow River as a case study area. The project is supported by CGIAR. Uh, it's actually about 10 years ago already. So some background here for the uh, Yellow River Basin. It is the second largest river in China, uh, flows through uh, nine different provinces. It's located in the area to semi-area climbing zone. And starting from 1972, the most critical environmental issue in the Yellow River Basin is the stream flow cutoff due to the overuse of water, water resources. This diagram here shows from 1972 to 2000 for the length of the uh, stream flow cutoff, or they call it zero flow day, and also uh, how many days are late, just like this uh, figures. Okay. This photo shows the most, uh, most downstream in the year river basin, and you won't see any single drop out of water is flowing. And that caused a serious political issue for the Chinese government. So starting from 1999, uh, the central government of China, they started to use this, we call it top-down control management approach, unified water flow regulations, try to solve that issue. So the central government of China tell each prov provincial government says that this is the cap of your water withdrawal in, in your province. You cannot use more water uh, over this cap. So that's why we call it a top-down control. So when we uh, did, a, did a project, we proposed a new uh, 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 method, which is based on a water market scenario. We call it a bottom-up management scenario. We try to create a water trading mechanism that allow each water users, which were, I will define as agent later, to either buy or sell their water rights and see whether that uh, management ma method can also solve that issue. Okay. So, this figure, uh, this big one, this figure shows the boundary of the yellow, yellow river basin. And each color of the polygons that you see, it's what we define as a water user. It's based on their uh, similar quarter, uh, crop type, similar, uh, similar crop uh, schedule, and because they are located uh, near to each other, so they have a similar hydroeconomic condition and, and also climatic, climatic conditions. So there are 52 water users in the Yellow River Basin. We define them as 52 water uh, water use agents. 
just like this um, orange rectangle. There are five key reservoirs along the main stand, and we define them as reservoir agents. There are three critical uh, habitats at a, at a downstream area. We define them as ecosystem agents. And these agents, they are connected through the river channel. So this is what we call an agent system map. It tells you how each agent is connected to each other. Then how we solve this? Right? How, how we solve this by creating the water market? Let me show you. So uh, at first, let's look at, 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 at the basic scale. Okay. So if at the very beginning, I tell each agent, if you sell me one cubic meter of your waters, I'm going to pay you one billion US dollars. Then what do you think will happen? Then presumably, if we assume every agent is trying to pursue its own benefit, then at that case, every agent will try to, try to sell their water, right? Because when the water price is so high, so they are intended to sell their water. And because of that, everyone is selling, no one is using, that means at a system level, at, at a basin level, the total water consumption will be zero. Okay. But obviously, that situation cannot be held because everyone is selling, no one is buying. That's not even a market. So which means the water price has to go down. And when the water price goes down, some agent will start to think, you know what, selling water doesn't make sense anymore. Because if I use my water to irrigate my crop and I sell my crop, it's actually more profitable. So when a water price goes down, the total system-wide water consumption will go up. And this increasing trend of the water consumption will be capped by the physical availability, uh, physical water availability inside the Yellow River Basin. At that stage, we actually call it an equilibrium state. And this will, will result in an equilibrium state a water price PI star. So now if we look at this PI star at the agent level, this is what we call an agent's demand function. X-axis is water price, Y-axis is water consumption. This PI star, we are corresponding to a XX star, equilibrium state water consumption. Then we can compare this XX star with its original water right. If this XX star is less than the water right, then we say this agent is selling water. If XX star is larger than the water right, then we say this agent is buying water. And this is how we create these water markets to allow each agent to connect with each other. Okay. So before I show some results, I need to demonstrate the credibility of my agent is model, right? So what we did is we compare our um, the traditional mo mo uh, model setting with the uh, observation data. So uh, what we see here is from agent one to agent 52, uh, uh, the annual water consumption. We also compare with uh, five uh, different key reservoirs, their water storage, and also compare the uh, the uh, stream flow pattern from upstream to midstream to downstream. So obviously the model is not perfect, right? We actually underestimate some water consumption. The storage is also not 100% match, and the flow pattern is also is some underestimation. But at least we capture the overall trend for every one of them. Okay, so that gives us more confidence. Says that okay, this model is uh, at least that's reasonable, so we can use that for different scenario. So let me show you some results. This is the uh, this slide shows the basin wide water consumption right hand side, uh, left hand side, and the DDT on the right hand side. Uh, different colors of the lines shows a different management uh, approach. The orange one is the UWFR, the traditional approach. And the blue line is a water market or the agent based modeling approach. So this figure shows that uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether that's the monthly pattern or the annual water consumption, they are very close. These two maps are very close. But because we do a lot of water trading, so uh, right hand side, uh, the water market scenario actually generates more benefit during the high flow season. If we calculate the differences, the annual differences will be about 23 billion RMB. So this number is what we call the benefit of introducing water market to the system. And this slide shows the benefit of introducing water market to the human society, right? Because either uh, the water consumption or GDP, they are both human benefits. 
Then how about environment? How about ecosystem agent? So remember I said there are three uh, critical habitat and we define them as ecosystem agent at the very downstream of the yellow river basin. So these three hydrographs are the ideal hydrograph for those three ecosystems that are coming from some local ecologist. So the government actually told us when we, when we did a project, it says that even though when I introduce the water market, I still want to maintain the stream flow pattern for these three ecosystem agents. So we did that and we run a model and here's the result. So under that condition, the total water buying by agent will be 4.2 BCM billion cubic meter per year. Total water selling will be 7.5 BCM per year. So obviously there are more people want to sell the water than people want to buy, right? And who's buying? In this case, it's actually the government. So the, the annual difference is, is about 3.2 BCM. And if we multiply this by the average uh, water price, it's about 3 billion RMB, and that's a cost for the government, that the government needs to buy those water and keep that water in a, in, in a channel, so then uh, we can satisfy the flow pattern for these three ecosystem agents. And remember the benefit of introducing the water market from the previous slide, we say, it's 23 billion RMB. Then naively, if we compare the cost and the benefit, then we say this is, uh, since cost is less than the benefit, this will be a self-sustaining system. That means the government can just impose some like water trading tax and use that tax to, to pay for the cost so it can create a win-win situation for both human society and ecosystem. Then obviously this is a, 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 a like a pilot study. We did not consider like uh, the translation cost. We did not consider some administrative costs, but we just use this, this uh, case study to demonstrate a water market can actually work um, in the large uh, rural basin, okay? So that's how we use ABN to quantify human uh, ecosystem interaction. And that's the first step. And that's the easiest step. That's the reason I did it. So for the harder part, I actually relied on my postdoc and my student to help me to do this. So after we finish that, the next step will be, then how can we simulate human decision under the year-by-year -year natural variability? So I actually didn't mention this. When I build the uh, Yellow River Basin models, we only run a model for one year. Everything is deterministic, okay? But in reality, it's actually not, right? Everyone knows that although there could be high flow season and low flow season, which we know, but year by year, how much water we will got is still unknown. So we want to know how this uh, 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 year by year variability is going to affect human decision in things like crop uh, area and also hydropower generation. That's when we shift to the second question, how, how can we accommodate natural variability? And we're going to use Mekong River as a case study area. The project is also supported by CGIAR. This is about, I think, three, four years ago. Again, some background here for Mekong. Uh, it is the sec uh, uh, sixth largest river in the world. Uh, there are over 15 million people live in the basin, depends on the wa uh, river for their water supply and their food productions. There are several uh, critical ecosystems or uh, hotspots like located inside the Mekong River uh, boundaries. And the primary energy source in the basin is actually hydropower. So the number you see here is the percentage of hydropower that contribute to the power uh, supply for that country inside the, the, um, the uh, Mekong River. So similar to the yellow rural basin setting, we also gonna define a water user as an agent. And in, in the Mekong, we only define 12 agents because of the data limitations. But we do have 32 dams and 23 ecosystem hotspots uh, inside the entire basin. So as I said earlier, in order to accommodate this natural variability, what we, what we did is we couple our agent-based model with a process-based hydrological model. And a process-based hydrological model we use is called SWAT, Soil and Water Assessment Tool. I think most of you might know this already. already. It is the largest scale uh, 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 basing, uh, uh, the largest scale river basing models that try to quantify uh, the, the impact of land management on the stream flows. It is open source, so the source code is written in Fortran, which allows us to modify it so we can couple that with our agent-based model. 
it is uh, physically based or process based under the uh, daily uh, time step. So we can actually generate uh, like the uh, daily stream flow. Some people call it fully or some people call it semi-distributed because uh, SWA used HRU, hydro response unit, to calculate, to uh, simulate the uh, actual rainfall runoff process. So similar to the yellow river basin models, we also need to demonstrate the credibility of our models. So we calibrate SWA uh, against the, uh, the stream flow uh, along the main stem. Again, the model is, is obviously not perfect, but we at least capture the trends of the stream flow. So we say, okay, we can couple our, our, our ABM with the SWAT model. And here's how we did it. We actually start with the SWAT simulations. Okay, so from day one, year one, we just click the button and the SWAT uh, start to run. It will, it will uh, pro uh, generate the daily stream flow, uh, the annual crop yield, and also uh, the daily reservoir storage and release bus. At the end of that year, we're gonna put the, everything into the agent base model. And in order to run the agent based model, there are some other required in, uh, input data, like how other agents' uh, behavior, decisions, and what's their own agricultural hydropower and ecosystem target. So after that, we run ABN, and then ABN will generate uh, different uh, output, which is like uh, different reservoir operation rules, and also the uh, decision on irrigated area. These will become the input that sent back to SWAT, and SWAT will start the second year's simulation. And then this loop will continue to the end of our simulation period, and we will output everything. Okay. So this slide gives you a high-level concept that how we do the this called two-way coupled between an agent-based model and a SWOT, a process-based hydrologic model together. Then in the next slide, I'm gonna dig into deeper inside the ABN. So what what is, I'm gonna show you what is really happening inside the agent-based model. So we, uh, in the Mekong River Basin uh, project, we use the, this so-called rule-based simulation ABN setup. As I say, we start with SWOT, right? And then SWOT will do some simulation, send the information to, a, uh, to ABN. And this is what actually happened inside ABN. And at the end, um, ABN will, will generate something and send it back to SWOT. Okay. So this is the, the, like the, the technical part of how these two models are coupled linked together. And in, in this project for the ABN, there are two different aspects that's gonna affect agent's decision. The first one, which is uh, everything here, which you don't need to look at the detail, but this box just says that agent's decision is based on its own priority. So whether this agent rank crop production is the highest priority, hydropower or ecosystem health is the highest priority. The other aspect is how others will behave. So this one we call it level of cooperation, AOC which will, I will um, explain this later, okay? So this is how uh, technically we actually uh, uh, coupled a process-based uh, hydrological model and our ABN together. Then let me show you some results. So remember our purpose is try to uh, figure out how the stream flow variation and also uh, the, like the agent's preference uh, affecting the, the re re results. So I'm just gonna show you some um, examples. Uh, I just pick one agent randomly, like locally. This is the agent, uh, I think it's 1,000 Laos, I think. And you will see the x-axis is different years, y-axis is, is crop production. And obviously, because the stream flow is different, so you will see the uh, different crop production for every year. And then if, if this agent rank, hydro, uh, uh, rank the agricultural production as the highest priority, you will see an increasing trend. If it, it, it rank at, at the lowest priority, you will just hold it as a constant. Right? Another example is another agent, uh, the reservoir over here. Uh, again, you will see the annual variability of the hydropower generation and how its uh, uh, priority on hydropower generation is affecting its uh, actual uh, energy production. Okay. So this is the first uh, tier of the results. The second one actually related to this, what we call level of cooperation, which is uh, a direct interaction between different agents. And this is actually based on a true story. So in 2016, I think, in 2016, the most downstream country in Mekong, Vietnam, has a serious drought. So it's actually affecting its own crop production. And the Vietnamese government, they cannot do nothing. So what they did is they actually called the Chinese government to ask them to release more water from the, from the Chinese dam 
to help Vietnam to mitigate that drought? And Chinese government said yes. So they actually released more water from the Dian, and that, that actually impact their own uh, hydropower to help Vietnam. So what we try to do here is we 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 want to quantify this like like the actual real world human interaction into our agent based model. So we use some conditional probability um, to put that into our, our 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 coding. I will skip all the mathematical details, but if you want to know more details, you can contact me offline. So we put that in our model, and we want to see whether that actually happened uh, during our simulation period. And it actually did. So we, at, uh, we did a simulation from, I think, 1983 to 2007, something like that. During that period, again, it is Vietnam has dropped again. And this time, it also called for help. But this, uh, it was this uh, then in, in central Laos response its uh, request. So let's see how uh, this re request affecting this uh, reservoir agent's behavior. These two figures shows the water storage and release differences of this reservoir agent. The green line here is the normal run of its reservoir storage. <clears throat> and the red line here is when this then try to help Vietnam. So that means uh, because it re releases more water, so it has less storage inside um, its dam. And the differences of these two lines can be represented by this release. So during the response years, this reservoir releases more water, and during the recovering years, it actually releases less water, so it can recover its or, or original storage. Okay, so that's the result. And then we also observe one interesting thing, and we call it third-party impact. That's related to other agents. So the, this interaction is between this water use agent and that reservoir agent, right? But because these, uh, there are some other agents that locate in between, physically located in between those, those two agents, so their decision will also be affected. So for, for example, in this case, we actually observe this central loss agent has a slightly reduced in its own food production, but the, the, most, the, the other downstream agent, Cambodia, actually has a slight increase of its food production because the water is, uh, availability is different. Okay. Okay, so this is how we uh, couple our ABN with a process-based hydrologic model to accommodate these kind of like natural variability. And if you think that's hard, modeling human behavior is even harder. Because human behavior is actually co uh, affected by this so-called, we call it like common sense, right? Again, let me give you an example to, to, to show you what I mean. So let's say this guy, he just get off the work and he wanna go home as soon as possible. If I did not give you any information, there are three routes in front of him. Then which route you think this guy will take? Theoretically, you are, your, your best guess will be B, right? Because that's the most straightforward, the, the shortest cut. So if he want to go home uh, as soon as he can, he should take B. But if I tell you, B is actually an unpaved road and it is raining right now. Then which route do you think he will take? Then it could be A, right? Because it's muddy uh, uh, for route B, so it might slow him down. But if according to Google Maps, there's a car accident that happened close to his home. Then if I ask you the question again, which guy, uh, which route this guy will take? Then the answer becomes interesting, right? You can say, okay, uh, then this guy might think, uh, yeah, there's a car accident, so I might just still take B, uh, even though uh, I have, to, I have to drive drive slowly. Or this guy can say, since the car accident is close to my home, when I get there, it might be resolved, so it should be fine. Or the safest route is C. Right? This is what I mean by human behavior is defined by common sense. So we know you want to go home as soon as possible, but exactly which route you will take is actually uh, uncertain. And that's what we're going to target in our third project. A, it's an ongoing project sponsor, uh, sponsored by uh, DOE, Department of, of Energy, Office of Science. This is actually a big project led by a, uh, Pacific Northwest National Lab, PNNL, and collaborate with, with a lot of other national labs. The title of the, to uh, of the project is Integrate Multi-Sector Multi-Scale Modeling. And our part, uh, our contribution to this project is try to use ABN to simulate human behavior uncertainty. And we use the same one river basin as the case study area. 
So again, some background for San Juan. It is the uh, largest tributary of the uh, Colorado River Basin, located at a four corner area, so four different states. It is a typical Western US basin. So the, by that, I mean there are multiple stakeholders involved, uh, federal government, uh, control of land, uh, state governments, uh, there are, there are uh, city governments, uh, different farmers, uh, two uh, power plants that are using water for the cooling purpose. And there's even a Indian nation, Indian tribals involved because they have some unutilized water rights. So the way we handle this we also, is that we also couple our ABN with a process-based model. But this time we couple that with a, uh, a, a river routing model. It's called uh, river wear. Technically, everything is the same as a main call. So we do the same uh, two-way coupling, send the information back and forth. But in, in this project, this rural wear model is also coupled with a uh, energy production cost model, Plexos. But that's not the, uh, the focus of this talk today. So for the same one rural basin, what we did is we defined different uh, group of, of farmer as agents, and their decision is how much how much water they should irrigate or how large their irrigated area should be. Um, so in inside this basin, there's a key reservoir, Navajo reservoir, uh, almost at the middle of the basin, and um, uh, there are agents located upstream, downstream about uh, of this reservoir, and also on the tributary. In this uh, project, we use uh, a similar setting as Mekong. We call it looking backward, but acting forward. So that means all agents were using its previous experiences but making the decision for the coming year. Because that actually fit the real world human decision making process, right? You, everyone use uh, its own experiences to decide what he or she should do for the next second. And again, I'm going to skip all the um, mathematical detail how we actually put this human behavior uncertainty in, uh, uh, in our models. I will just give you a high level concept. But if you are interested in the mathematical detail, you're welcome to contact me offline. So we use these two methods, basic inference math, BM mapping, and also cost loss, loss model to do that. So uh, the process of BM mapping is to help us to create this what we call conjunctive map. And we use that to represent the internal thinking process inside a farmer's brain to create or to calculate the probability of, of his intention to e expand irrigated area. So the intention or the decision here is the uh, irrigated area change. And this decision will be affected by different, we call it preceding factors, the colors in green. And this is, as, as I said, this is what we call a conjunctive map. So this is the, the thinking process inside the farmer's brain. And then after that, we, we, we compare this probability with some ex external economic factors using these classical cost loss model uh, equations and to determine the external economic uh, impact on, uh, on this farmer's decision. So whenever I give this kind of uh, uh, talk to explain this, I always use a real world e example. So for, for example, Apple just announced a new iPhone, right? If I ask you to build a model to predict whether this person, this guy, uh, he, he, whether he will buy a new iPhone or not, actually you can use this, this kind of, of method. So you want to create a conjunctive map and then the, 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 the decision is whether he's going to buy an iPhone or not. And the preceding factor is uh, like his previous experience with Apple products, uh, maybe his uh, families, uh, everyone is using iPhones. All these preceding factors is uh, increasing its probability to buy a new iPhone. Right? By the end, you still need to compare the, the price of the new iPhone. Right? So if this guy really, 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 really likes uh, the Apple product, then it doesn't matter how expensive the new iPhone is. He will just buy it. But if you are people like me, I'm okay with Apple product. However, if a, a new iPhone only costs me like five bucks, then I will maybe just buy it because you know because that's only five bucks. Why not? Right. So that's the um, so we we use a similar logic to put these things um, into our agent based model. Similar to the previous two uh, projects, I also need to demonstrate the credibility, right? And this time, what we did is we compare the agent's decision with the historical um, observation. So we have 16 agents in our um, in our basins. So what we see here is 16 different agents. 
X axis is different years from 1920s to 2010, I think. Y axis is, is irrigated area. Blue line is historical records. We got it from uh, Bureau of uh, uh, Reclamation. Red line is our model. So what we did is that uh, in, inside our model, there are some parameters we can calibrate it. What we try to do is to match the red line to the blue line. And as you can see, overall, we we got the patterns, right? The, either that's a decreasing or some increasing or some flag pattern. We actually capture how the agent uh, change its irrigated area. But obviously, there, there are some agent we just cannot get it, especially for this kind of sudden drop or sudden jump of the, its irrigated area. Our current model structure can never capture that. But overall, we are, we are still doing a fairly good job. One thing I did not mention is the dash black line over here. I did see what we call like the, the traditional or no uh, basin inference map agent based model. You can think about this as the Mekong River Basin uh, ABM model that we use. So, what we want to demonstrate here is that by adding uh, the human decision uncertainty into the ABM, we actually improve uh, the ABM model to make it more closer to um, the, uh, the reality. Okay, so that's how we demonstrate. Yeah, the model is reasonable, so we can use that for different simulations. The first thing we see, we, we, we try is, we want to use this model to address risk perception. So inside our model, there's a parameters for each agent that we can fine tune it to say that this agent is aggressive to expand its irrigate area or conservative to expand its irrigate area. In mathematical terms, uh, when, whenever an agent is conservative, we call it its risk avert, and that's represented by the blue line in all these figures. When agent becomes aggressive, that's what we call risk seeking, and represented by all the green lines over here, and the red lines are our uh, historical run. So there are two figures here. Left-hand side is a basin wide result, right-hand side is individual uh, agents. So for uh, the basin wide result, we, we look at like the total irrigated area, reservoir level, and flow violations. And these are the CDF uh, figures, accumulated distributed functions. And so what you can see here is that uh, if all agents inside the basin become aggressive, that means red line become green line, then you will see the total irrigated area will increase, right? That, that, that more or less makes sense because everyone become ag aggressive. And if everyone become conservative, that's from red to blue, then you will see total irrigated area decrease. A similar result can be found for other matrix for the basin wide. Then for the, for the individual uh, agent's results, it's over here. So we pick four um, example agents to show you. Uh, so uh, what you see here is that agent in group one is located upstream of that uh, level hole reservoir. Agent in group two is located in uh, on a tributary. So the decision of these two a, uh, group of, of agents are not going to be affected by the reservoir operation. And because of that, because of that, what you see here is the red line, the historical line, is almost overlap with those blue lines. That means that means in reality. Since these agents are located upstream or on the territory of the main reservoir, they know their action won't be backed by the reservoir operation. So they become very conservative. Okay. On the other hand, agents in group three, they are located downstream of the Navajo reservoir, the main reservoir. Then what you see here is those red line actually deviate from the blue line, it located in the middle between green and blue line. So we actually call this agent risk neutral because they are located downstream of the reservoir. So they now, compared to the upstream or the tributary neighbors, they can become a little bit more aggressive when they de decide their irrigated area because if they know, uh, yeah, they know if they need more water, reservoir can actually release some water to help them. Okay, so that's one of the interesting uh, results that we found. Okay, so then the last re result I'm going to show here is then what if what if um, uh, expanded irrigation area become more expensive? How is that going to affect agents' behavior? So I'm showing you here is again 16 different agents, 
And then there's a parameter inside our model. We can actually uh, do some sensitivity analysis to show the to show to show the result. So what you see here again, red line is the historical run. The sky blue and the blue line means ir uh, expanded irrigated area become more expensive. The pink and purple line means expanded irrigated area, irrigated area become more cheaper. So then you you, you actually see Asian response to that uh, very reasonably when you become more e expensive. Uh, some agent will just even uh, reduce its irrigated area, but when you, it becomes more cheaper, it will expand the irrigated area um, uh, more quickly. Okay, so this is how we use ABN to address human behavior on sudden. And I'm just going to wrap up here. So the talk I gave today is about couple human uh, nature complex systems, and, and I focus more on the uh, Wi-Fi nexus issue. I use three different aspects uh, to show you how we did this, we, how we quantify the human ecosystem interactions, how we accommodate natural variability, and how we address human decision uncertainty. And then some ongoing project in my group right now. So the, uh, the DOE project is still actually ongoing, and what we want to do is dig into deeper about the uh, spatial and temporal scale issues. So we want to see whether we can use ABN approach to upscale uh, the human decision uncertainty by comparing the current model that we have for the tributary versus the entire Colorado river basin model. Okay. And our group just got a new uh, NSF project. We try to build a uh, ABN framework for the Columbia river basin um, to evaluate to evaluate with its uh, reliability, resilience, and vulnerability. What we want to do here in this project is we try to adapt the structured uh, public, uh, public participation in the ABN framework to see whether we can use this ABN framework to facilitate the treaty negotiation between US and Canada. And here at the last slide, I just want to thank all of my collaborators because I obviously cannot do this by myself. I also want to thank Catherine and the quality staff who facilitated this talk. At the end, uh, let me shamelessly make some advertisements. Uh, we do have a, a, a Twitter account, so you're welcome to follow us. And also, we do have uh, a PhD student and a, a postdoc student position available in our in our group. So if you're interested uh, or you know somebody uh, they are interested in these two positions, please contact me. Um, thanks again for your time. I will be happy to take any question you might have. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ethan, for that uh, interesting talk about so many different and important river basins. Does anyone have any questions? And you could ask them. I think you could. There should be a question box where you'd be able to write your question, and I'd be able to see that. Or you could raise your hand, and I could unmute you as well. That'd be another way to do it, I think. Huh, I did a great job. There's no question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll, I'll ask a question in the meantime, maybe as people are thinking or trying to type something out. Um, so, okay, so for the San Juan River Basin, um, perhaps I was blanking out while you were talking, but, um, or when you said it, but did you, it's over multiple years on a, what's the time scale of it? And, um, yeah, so like, for example, if it's monthly, how much would having daily information matter? or um, what are you specifically looking at in terms of temporal variability that you, you mentioned that you're going to be doing in the future? Yeah, so yeah, great question. So the, for the same one, um, the model itself is running on a, on a daily time step. So each day okay. they simulate how much, yeah, how much water they withdraw and then how they're going to contribute to the crop yield. But the communication between the process-based model and the agent-based model is at an annual basis. So every year, actually starting from the water year, which is October 1st, um, uh, the process-based model River will send past year's information to ABM, and then uh, each agent will decide how much water, uh, it will decide the uh, irrigated area for the coming years. So the model itself is strong on the, on the, on the daily time set, but the communication is every year. And uh, I know in the past, so for example, for your Mekong study, you did um, 
surveys to look at people's preference, the agent's preferences and yep. choices, but it seems in this case you've simply calibrated it. Is that correct? Or are you also in contact with the these agent groups and, and you know, surveying them or finding out what their preferences are as they state them? Yeah, so uh, we did not do the survey for the same one. And uh, the reason for that is, yes, we tried to build a different modeling uh, ABN structures so we can actually calibrate the parameter that we that that usually yes yes you need to do the survey. Uh, the reason behind it is that because doing the survey is too costly. So if we can figure out a way to um, somehow quantify uh, those things uh, and uh, 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 based on the calibration process, it should save us a lot of time for the future if we want to expand this to the other um, area. But however, we do in contact with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation because. As I say, like like I said, for some agents like this one and this one, we just cannot gap it, and that means our fundamental assumption for our quantitative map, which means the 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 equation that we build to represent what's happening inside that farmer's brain, is actually wrong for this agent and that agent. That's the reason we we just cannot gap get its um, um its pattern. Okay, and uh, we actually do have a question from someone in the audience asking what's the, um, so the question is, what is the time framework for developing a project like that that can show a significant <laughs> pattern? So basically timeline. For the project itself, is right? I think so. I think that's, yeah, I think that's yeah, the question. Yeah, so asking. the Yellow, Yellow River project is actually uh, my, my PhD series is back to 10 years ago. So that one is about two years. Mekong uh, is about three years, and that's also one of my students' PhD, uh, which is actually Hassan Kwan, Dr. Hassan Kwan, uh, last, last week's uh, speakers. It also took him about two and a half years, three years. And this Seng Wang Basin is still ongoing. This is a three-year project. We are, I am presenting the first one and a half years results, so we are actually still expanding the, uh, the ABN. And uh, the one I just mentioned, that uh, compared with the Colorado, Colorado uh, basin is actually the next three years. So, yeah, it's a, if you think about it, it's actually a fairly, uh, it's not a single year project for sure. Great. Um, is there any other questions before we end? I'll wait a moment and see. Sure. All right, well, um, I guess there's no questions now. If you think of any, I'm sure Ethan would be happy to uh, talk with you more afterwards. And uh, looking forward to another great presentation next week um, at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So hope to see you back then. And thank you again, Ethan. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All right, bye. All right, bye-bye.